Exodus chapter 5, verse number 1. This is going to be our jumping off point this morning, so don't think we're going to stay right here. Exodus chapter 5, verse number 1. Joe, good to see you this morning. Everything okay? Good. All right. Verse number 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens. In other words, get back to work. The world has no problem with Christianity. I want you to listen to that statement because you're probably already thinking, Preacher, you're nuts. The world does have a problem with Christianity. Now listen, the world has no problem with Christianity just as long as the world defines what that Christianity looks like and not the Bible nor genuine Bible followers. The culture wars that we have been in here in America at least for the last 50 plus years are, and will continue to go through by the way, uh, don't think that because we have a Republican in the White House, the culture wars go away. They just intensify. Uh, just understand the culture wars that we have gone through and will continue to go through until the Lord returns and sets everything new. Uh, even Solomon, by the way, one of the wisest men to have ever lived on God's green earth, told us in the book of, of Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun. And even secular observationists, have stated that, quote, if there is one thing certain from history is that history repeats itself. Point is, what Christianity is going through in terms of its transformative state is nothing new. And I'm not saying a reformation. And I'm not even saying that we're reforming. But there is an agenda out there to transform this. And this morning, I'd like to look at the discourse between Pharaoh and Moses, and in that discourse, we find just what Solomon told us thousands of years ago, that there is indeed nothing new under the sun. The culture has, the culture is, and the culture will continue to define a version of Christianity that is acceptable to the masses. A version that is worldly as opposed to a version that is biblical and that is opposed to the world, the flesh, and the devil. The title of our message this morning is this, A Cultural Christianity. A Cultural Christianity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look to your words today. Father, I am so glad that we have in our possession a book that gives us all the answers. Amen. Father, the ills of the world today have already been dealt with in the Word of God in some form and fashion. And Father, we're so thankful that we have a final authority to point back to and interpret in immediate context for today. And Lord, I pray this morning as we look at this cultural Christianity that has been propped up and accepted by the masses, I pray, Father, that we, as Bible-believing Christians, would offer that counterbalance because we're not going with the culture. Amen. And Father, I pray this morning that if there be somebody in our midst who is not saved, that says, Preacher, I don't know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I don't know if Christ is my Savior. Lord, I pray that they would receive you as Lord and Savior. Father, if there be somebody here that just needs equipping, encouraging from your word, I pray you'd give it to them. Father, maybe there's somebody here that's saved but hasn't been scripturally baptized. We pray, Father, that you would move them and their heart to be faithful. We ask you now, Father, you'd bless our time. In Jesus Christ's name we ask it all. Amen. Amen. 
I want you to notice the context of the text here, the context of the text here in Exodus chapter 5. We find, and most of you know this narrative, I'm sure, that the Israelites are in bondage in the land of Egypt. This is pretty obvious. It's pretty apparent. And you've all read Ephesians chapters 1 through at least Ephesians 15, because that's mainly the part of Exodus that most of us want to read. Because when we get towards the end of Exodus, it starts talking about the tabernacle, then it starts to get very taxing. But nevertheless, you read all of it. It's good stuff. Uh, but uh, it's usually the first 15 chapters that really get us going. And the first 10 chapters in particular, between the discourses of Moses and Pharaoh, and of course Aaron thrown in there as well. Now, not only are the Israelites in bondage in Egypt, and of course you don't need any of me reminding you, but Egypt, of course, is a type of the world. Can we agree with that? Yeah. But, but they are serving at the whim and the will of the ruler of the land, who is Pharaoh, who can we also say is a picture of the God of this world. So the Israelites are in the world serving at the whim and will of the God of this world. And from the back and forth discussion between God and Moses in the various passages that we'll look at, and then Moses to Pharaoh, it is very apparent that God did not want his people living, nor, as you can tell here in the passage we're about to read, worshiping in Egypt. This command was to be delivered unto Pharaoh. Now notice again in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Exodus. Moses and Aaron went in, told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord. In other words, Moses is saying to Pharaoh, this is not my thing, this is not Aaron's thing, this is God's thing. Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. By the way, that is an interesting thing to say considering that Pharaoh thought they were his people. Yeah. But God's already showing possession. That's right. And everyone has to change fathers, amen? amen? Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now I'm not saying that I can bring the influx of his voice into that statement or that question, but you can tell the pessimism. And you can tell the arrogance, and you can tell that he just doesn't like to be told what's what. He says, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And then Moses says this, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Now, there's some interesting principles there in verse number three that you ought not to overlook. The first thing I want you to note is that God desired that Israel sacrifice and worship in a particular place. Is that important? Not just any place. And by the way, if we kind of reference it for the New Testament, this is why church is a special place, not just a particular place of your choosing. Now on Wednesday nights, I, I, on last Wednesday night I went through a rant and I talked about how I loathe this description of how people choose church. Uh, we've had these people that come through and they'll say things like this. Well, I believe that choosing a church is much like choosing a flavor of ice cream. And I've thought to myself, if you only knew how stupid that makes you sound. I had ice cream last night. I enjoy ice cream. But the fact of the matter is, what happens when the flavors go away? Or what happens when you don't like a particular flavor anymore? Or what happens when you don't have any more ice cream to choose from? Do we just give up on church? Church is not like choosing a flavor of ice cream at Baskin Robbins. According to this passage and according to the principle that is being set here for Israel, and I believe spiritually can be applied too to the New Testament, church is not just any particular place, or in fact, church isn't just a particular place that you think of. God told Israel, you go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto me to the place I want you to go. Amen. In the passage, God chose the place. Yes. Fast forward a bit. Pharaoh would not hearken unto God's voice through Moses. Therefore, from the narrative, as it continues on, God sent plague after plague until finally 
we see this exchange here in this passage, and then, of course, we're going to see some more here in just a few moments. And he said, do you believe those plagues happened just like the Bible says it? Just like it says it. Amen. I believe every one of those plagues happened. Now, this brings us to the cultural compromise that came from the mouth of Pharaoh. And there's interesting, it's very interesting as you read through the discourses between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh, that Pharaoh seemingly lets them do their thing, but with a few caveats. And I want to point out some of those caveats today that have such wonderful parallels to today. And the first thing is in Exodus chapter 8, verse 25. Setting the template there in Exodus 5 of letting my people go three days journey into the desert to the place of God's choosing. Notice Exodus chapter 8 verse number 25 and this of course is still in the middle of this discourse between Pharaoh and Moses. Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said... Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. You say, what happened? Well, if you read the verse prior, there was a grievous swarm of flies that were plaguing e Egypt. And notice in verse 24, And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh. Now, I want you to think about that for a second, because you're thinking, well, how that's a, how's that a plague? There's one fly in this sanctuary right now, and it's bugging me. One. It's flying around, it has a white head, and it's saying, uh, that's, help me, exactly, thank you, that's the Vincent Price movie. But, but, but here's the thing, it's one fly, and it's bugging me. Can you imagine a million? I mean, in this, this, this location, just in this room. How about a couple million? And how about not just flies, I mean blow flies, deer flies, horse flies. And whatever else kind of flies God can make on the whim. And Apple panned out. Thank you very much. I'm quick, man. I got it. But seriously, folks, one fly bugs me. When one fly gets in the house, I am on a pursuit to destroy it. What we'll do to try to not kill it, because, you know, that becomes gross. Because, you know, I just don't... It's amazing how you can just kind of kill a fly literally by just flicking it. But no, I want to kill it by mashing it into utter oblivion. So what we'll try to do is we'll open the window and get it trapped in the screen and then close the window real quick and let it slowly die in there <laughs> because we're, we're animal extremists around here. But, no, but here's the point. These flies came into Egypt and Pharaoh says in verse 25, he says, listen, go sacrifice to your God in the land. Evidently, Pharaoh was excited. But let me tell you what he did. He offered Moses and Israel a compromise. He offered them a cultural God. Notice verse 25 again. Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the desert. No, didn't say that. He said, In the land. You say, What do you say? Stay in Egypt. Pharaoh offered Moses and Israel a cultural compromise through means of a cultural God. How does, how does this apply today, you might ask? Can I, say, can I put it to you this way? Many people today want to mix God and the world together. And, and if there's anything that doesn't mix is water and oil and God and the world. They just don't mix. People today attach the name of Christianity to everything from rock music to hip-hop to sodomite behavior. That's right. Many in the cultural church today have adopted the cultural Christian compromise of Pharaoh. Hey, we'll worship, but not where God wants us to worship. We'll stay in the land. And we'll be influenced by the world and the flesh and the devil. And, and you know what? We can't really go against all that, so we'll kind of bring a little bit of that in. That's right. That's right. Amen. There was a reason why God said, get out of Egypt yeah. to serve me. Amen. You say, well, what, what is it? Uh, but we're, we're in Egypt, aren't we? Well, we're talking about a system. Right. 
a, a type of thinking, a, a philosophy. Guess what happens when we separate from the world on Sundays and come to a location? Yeah. You ever think about that? Right. Do you know what you're doing in type? Is you're leaving Castaic. You're leaving Valencia. You're leaving Saugus. You're leaving Acton. You're leaving wherever you happen to reside. And you come to the location that God has placed as the location to worship. Amen. Which tells me not just any place is worship. And this cultural God stuff is destroying any semblance of what church is today. Folks, the God of the Bible and the God of this world have nothing in common. Pharaoh said, listen, yeah, I know that God told you to go three days out in the desert, but I'll offer you a compromise. You can worship him, but stay in the land. Stay in the land. He offered them a cultural God. Number two, let's move on in the narrative. Verse 26, and Moses said, it is not meet to do so. <laughs> For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Look up here. Moses knew. Look here. Moses knew that if the compromise was made, then the compromise would continue to be made. Say it. Say amen. You know how that works. You can't compromise a little. You cannot move a little to the left thinking that the guy that's to the left is going to move a little to the right. Don't think that way. Moses already dealt with this with the Pharaoh with his day, and we're dealing it with the Pharaohs of our day, and so many people are saying, okay, we'll stay in Egypt. That's right. But Moses, the man of God that he was, he said, it is not meet to do so. It's not good. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, we sh shall we sacrifice the abomination of the, of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, here's the second compromise. Verse 28. I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. In other words... I'm going to let you go. You can even leave Egypt, but leave one foot here and the other foot where you're worshiping. Do you know how many Christians live their Christian life like that? Amen, amen. You got one foot in Egypt, you're not happy there. You got one foot where God wants you to worship, you're not happy there. You say, why? Because you've got to have both feet firmly planted in the proper location. Amen. Pharaoh said, listen, I'll let you go and worship. You can even leave Egypt, but don't go too far. Go ahead and leave the world. But don't leave the world too far behind. That's right. See, the culture, listen to me, folks. The culture has no problem with a Christianity. The problem has a problem, excuse me, the culture has a huge problem with a Christianity that is too extreme. That's right. They cannot handle Christians that just believe in moral absolutes. That's, that's not right. Why? Because CBS, NBC, and ABC don't define them that way. That's right. You have to live by the Christian dictates of the counterculture and you have to understand that if ABC, NBC and CBS don't tell you that's how you ought to live then that's not a version of Christianity that's acceptable that's right. the culture has a huge problem with a Christianity that is too extreme right. even though we serve a God that is extreme Amen. God said to that church at Laodicea he said I would that you're either hot or cold but this lukewarm stuff's not working for me right. that is not based upon conviction of the heart it is not, it's based upon the convenience of the moment. And so what did Pharaoh do? He offered them a God of convenience. A God of convenience. A convenient God. 
Pharaoh told them, go, but don't go too far. After all, if things get too tough out for you in the, in, in the Lord's work, you can always come back to the leeks and the melons. Christian, if you are genuine, the roots of your conviction will go down deep. Amen. None of this surface conviction that is shaped and moved by the culture and modern opinion. That's right. You should be able to sit through a news program like me and think you are watching a Laurel and Hardy show. Amen. I, some of you are... Wondering who that is. But anyway, who they were, I should say. Uh, okay, um, whatever popular thing today, you know. Just, I, I can't believe how some of you can watch that and say, I, I can't believe, I need to take that seriously. You don't watch that like you're reading through the comics? And just kind of go, you guys are so tough. Like They think I'm going to like believe that? Listen, with all of the positive and pro-sodomite coverage that the sodomites have received in the last several years and they've received a lot. I'm still anti-sodomite because I'm pro-Bible and pro-truth. See how this works? You see, I already had a conviction going into this. The roots were already deep. So, so as I sit there in front of the boob tube I, and get bombarded by images and pro-sodomite stories, I just go to, I say to myself, I already know what the Bible says. I already know what the Bible says. I already know what I believe. I already know what life teaches. That's right. So this doesn't, this doesn't mess with me at all. Yeah. See, and then, but then there's some Christians that their roots are not very deep. You can read about that in Matthew 13 with the parable. Yeah. You know, their roots are not very deep. And they're all about the cares of this world. And they're all about public opinion. And they're all about how people perceive of them in the, in the world. Right. And they're all worried about that. And they wring their hands and say, oh no. You know, I belong to a church that might be a little bit rough on that. Maybe I ought to find something over in Egypt. Listen to me. My opinion on any given topic does not change for the sake of convenience based upon the latest headline in the LA Times, the New York Times, or the Washington Compost. Right. I don't know why you would think that those news organizations would have any bearing on what I think. Amen. My convictions run deep even while the culture is trying to redefine what Christianity is through the God of convenience. Amen. We do not serve a convenient God. And we don't serve a God based upon convenience. Hey, we can go a little bit out there, but if it gets too hard out living the Christian life, we can always go back to Egypt. You don't think people do that? They do that a lot. Thirdly, move on with the narrative, Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Not only did Pharaoh offer a convenient God, not only did Pharaoh offer a cultural God, but I want you to notice in Exodus chapter 10 that he offered Israel a confined God. Exodus chapter 10, verse number 10. Exodus chapter 10. Verse number 10, let's start at verse number 8. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? Stop. Okay, so we've got the plague of locusts that lead up to this, this dialogue. We've got locusts. Now, I've never been around a plague of locusts. I know that when I water the back property of the house, there are some grasshoppers that are in the bushes, and when I hit the water on them, they jump, and they're like this big. They're big. I can imagine several thousands of those running through your backyard. That might be a little devastating. And, of course, if they're God-ordained, that's even worse. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so in verse 8, Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and, and he said unto them, Go, sir, Lord your God. But who are going with you? Look up here. He can't let this go, can he? Hey, I'll let you go, but give me a tally of who's going with you. Verse 9, and Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old and with our sons and with our daughters and with our flocks and with our herds. We will go for we must hold a feast of the Lord. Look up here. If you're a Christian, then you're all in. Amen. 
Amen? I mean, you're going to bring them all with you, right? Amen. It's not just, well, God has me, but then not all this other stuff over here. No, no, no. You're all in. That's what he's saying in verse 9. Verse 10. Pharaoh says, and he said unto them, let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. And then he changes his mind in verse 11. He says, I'll, in verse 10, he says, I'll let you go with the little ones. Verse 11, not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So Pharaoh says, okay, you can go out with your family. Mm, on second thought, maybe not. Just the men go out. So we have a compromise of a confined God. Go now, ye that are men. Now, I want you to listen closely. The culture has no problem. If you as an adult have made a decision to follow the Lord, just don't drag your children or anybody else in with you. You ever notice that you'll talk to adults that are not believers or maybe believers that are not very grounded and they'll say, well, this is good for you, but why drag them into this? I mean, come on now. If you've not had that conversation, then you haven't been living long enough. I know I've had that, I've had that conversation. By the way, I don't drag my children to church. They come. And, and even if they didn't come, I'd drag them. <laughs> because they're under my thumb right now. When they're 18 and they don't want to go to church, well, that's their thing. But, but, but right now, they're coming to church. Why? I want them under this influence. And so, the fact is, folks, it's amazing how the world says, well, you're an adult, that's fine, great, wonderful, good for you, but don't drag them into this. Today, many allow God into their lives in some areas, but not all. He's a confined God. In other words, God is confined to this area of my life. But I'm not going to let him have this area and this area and this area because this is my area. He's a confined God. They have confined God to this area of their life, but he is not to have anything to do with this area, though, because, well, that's another area. Pharaoh was saying, you that are men who have a firm conviction that cannot be swayed with the poles and pundits of Egypt, you go worship because we can't control you guys anyway. You guys believe what you believe. But leave your kids here in the education systems of Egypt. We'll take care of them. Oh, you didn't want me to go there, did you? Now, I know what, what some of you are going to say. Not all schools are like that. And you know, can I say something to you? You're right. Not all schools are like that. But most of them are. There are exceptions to the rule everywhere. I'm glad we have at least one public school teacher in our presence. That It's not like that. But I can say this. Most of them have become a cesspool of Egypt. Most of them. And what you need to have are, are, are men and women of conviction like Moses and Aaron who will say, you know what? We're just going to do what we're going to do. We're going to serve the Lord no matter what. Amen. Folks, God is not confined, so stop confining him. And Pharaoh was basically saying, listen, you men go out, but leave the family here. We'll take care of them. We do not serve a confined God. Amen. Fourthly, we'll end here. We do not serve. Exodus chapter 10, verse 24. Verse 24. A comfortable God. Verse 24 of chapter 10. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God, and we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. And then the Lord ended up hardening Pharaoh's heart. That's another message altogether, so don't even ask me the question after the services. 
The last compromise that comes from Pharaoh to Moses and the Israelites is a comfortable God. You say, what is a comfortable God, preacher? A God that does, a God that does not offend and a God that has no set path to him. Let me say that again. What is a comfortable God? A God that does not offend and a God that has no set path to him. Pharaoh said, leave your flocks behind. You notice in every discourse there was always a little concession here. And then there was a, an abrogating of that concession. Problem with that? You say, what's the problem with leaving the flocks behind, preacher? They would then have nothing to offer in sacrifice to the Lord. You say, what's the translation today, preacher? Today, the church wants a salvation without the cost of turning from sin. That's right. And a Christianity without the cost of commitment that comes with it. That's right. Leave your flocks behind. Yeah. But we won't have anything to sacrifice. Sacrifice is old hash anyway. Just go serve him. He'll be fine without your sacrifice. Look at here. He wants your sacrifice. You cannot serve without sacrifice somewhere. You cannot serve a God who comforts you in everything. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit of God doesn't comfort you in times of distress. That's not the point of this context here. What Pharaoh is saying is this. Leave those burdens here and just go out and serve God. The problem is, is God wants your burdens and all. Because He wants to deal with them. The world will never deal with your burdens. In fact, they'll give you more to go with the ones you left. You cannot serve a comfortable God. God desires sacrifice. And by the way, it was a specific sacrifice. That's right. Moses said, he says, we don't even know what God would want in our sacrifice until we get out there and he tells us. That's what he said in the prior conversation. We won't even know until we get out there and we find out from God what this sacrifice is. And guess what? They need to have complete preparation going into that. Amen. And Pharaoh was saying, you don't have to be prepared. Can I ask you a question, just as a side note? How many of you came prepared this morning to hear worship? Amen. How many of you came prepared to get your feet just literally drug into the mud? Amen. How many of you got prepared this morning to say, you know what, man, I, I cannot wait to sing standing on the promises of God my King. I cannot wait to see so-and-so and see this person. I cannot wait to just get around God's people. You ever prepared your heart like that? Instead, it's like, let's put in our hour. Now, don't look at me like that because I know that some of you. We cannot serve a comfortable God. Let me summarize all this. The world has no problem with Christianity just as long as they define what that Christianity looks like. It's being defined every day before your eyes on news sites and the TV and magazines and periodicals and political speeches and all kinds of things. There is a version of it. They want you to have a version of Christianity and they want you to have a version of Islam. They're defining the narratives for you. That's right. Now, if you're a thinking person, which is ironically what they think they are, yeah. <laughs> but if you're a thinking person who's looking at the news and you see, now again, I'm using an example. If you see a Catholic priest strapping bombs to themselves, you'd probably think maybe the Catholics have got something off the rocker. Yeah. Right. Especially if it was happening every day somewhere. Yeah. You might start thinking, maybe the Catholic Church has got some issues. Now, the Catholic Church has had some issues. The Catholic Church has a few issues. They will continue to have issues. But it's not the Catholic Church that's the problem right now. It's not them. No, it's not them. I'd feel a little safer with a priest than I would... I mean, come on, let's just be honest. 
feel a little safer. Of course, I'm good looking, so that might pose a problem. But nevertheless, God, I don't know why I got to go there. But anyway, but nevertheless, uh, the fact is, I'd feel more comfortable that way. It's amazing. You get all these, these, these terrorist attacks that happened in the last, oh, 48 hours in London. Yeah. And if we want to count the last couple weeks with the Manchester bombing, and if we want to go all the way back for maybe eight years, yeah. isn't it amazing? You, a Muslim does this, a Muslim does this, a Muslim does this, and the narrative is, it's not Muslims. Right. How is that possible? Yeah. What am I saying? I'm saying they have a narrative to push. Yes. They have a narrative to push about Christianity. They have a narrative to push about anything, and you have got to look at it like you're reading Calvin and Hobbes which is a comic strip, by the way, for those of you who don't read comic strips. You need to look at it like that. Why? Because the world has no problem with Christianity just as long as CBS, NBC, and ABC, and all the cable network news defines what it is. Christian, no matter how many times the world cries out for you to alter your course, just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. And to change your position on this and to alter your position on this, you stand firm upon the foundation of God's Word, which is your final authority. Don't just say, oh, I've got to alter a little bit. For what? The point is to change you. And you've been called to change the world by way of the Word of God. You let God and His Word dictate where you worship. Not Pharaoh in the world. You let God and His Word impact and saturate every portion of your life, not just the areas you want Him or that Pharaoh and the world tell you is okay. We do not serve a cultural Christianity. We are conviction Christians. And if you don't have roots set really deep, then Anderson Cooper will be your God. So much for 360.